Right, so. Right, here we go. Right, so it's a, a quite a long string of uh, characters. <coughs> the first few of which you can easily guess. Right, Dropbox. Com. Hey? Okay, okay. I'll just I'll just say it, it goes on and on for quite a while. <laughs> dot 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 dot. <coughs> it's 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 on here and um, it'll be on the website soon. Okay, so you can just get there from the website. And in that in that Dropbox account, in that Dropbox file, there is <coughs> this, which are exercises for this afternoon. And also, I've written some uh, what I call very rough notes of what I'm going to say today. And, and they really are very rough, right? There's almost no sort of complete sentences in there. It's just sort of formulae and things like that. So, <coughs> and I'll, I'll just tell you what this course is about, roughly speaking, before we get going. It's about, well, <coughs> the title is Complexes of Differential Operators. So that's my title. <coughs> OK, so differential complexes. This is about, really about differential geometry. <coughs> Sometimes there will be complex numbers involved. Uh, today, I mean, the word complex will not appear today apart from here, right, where it has a completely different meaning. Right? So I'm not talking about complex numbers at all today. I'm only talking about real things. Um, but tomorrow, I will say something about how this links in with several complex variables, for example. So most of the courses I notice in this, uh, in this uh, session, in, in this workshop, will be about complex analysis, several complex variables, most probably done in, in local coordinates, things like that. Whereas <coughs> I will start with local coordinates, but after a while I'll talk about manifolds and so on. Now, <coughs> you know, I don't want to insult, insult your intelligence or knowledge or anything like that, but I really am going to start at the beginning, more or less. Okay, so, <laughs> so I assume you know what partial derivatives are and the equality of mixed partial derivatives. That's about all, 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 all you need to know to get started. Apart from that, today I'm just going to talk about, uh, well, notation, and, <coughs> and I will introduce one of these uh, complexes of differential operators that you've probably not seen before, and um, it's a sort of model for, for what's going to happen throughout the, uh, throughout the, uh, the course, okay? But we'll start with things which I hope are reasonably familiar. And they are uh, three differential operators from <coughs> applied mathematics called GRAD, short for gradient, uh, CURL, short for CURL, and <coughs> DIP, which is short for divergence. So these three things are familiar differential operators, linear differential operators in three dimensions. What I want to do is just sort of run by you some notation for how this, uh, how this looks and, um, and at the same time introduce notation. Okay, so I'm introducing notation on what? I'm introducing notation on <coughs> uh, the space of three real variables, R3. So every time I talk about R3, well traditionally I might use the coordinates x, y and z and they, are, they, for example, appear in these exercises. Or, if I want to be a bit more fancy, I will <coughs> use coordinates x1, x2, and x3. Right, so this labels a point inside here. And the sort of first fundamental confusion of differential geometry is that this is not x squared. Right? This is called x1, x2, and x3. And they really are la always labelled like this in differential geometry. Nobody writes x sub 1 x sub 2 or x sub 3. It's always like this, and there's a reason for that. Okay? <laughs> but for the moment, you're just going to have to believe me. Right, so these are my coordinates. 
And as soon as you've got coordinates, you have the coordinate derivatives. And uh, so they will be <coughs> d by dx a, right, for <coughs> a equals 1 up to 3. Okay, and already I'm starting to use uh, indices here. This a runs over 1, 2, and 3 in this instance. And uh, in more exotic situations, it will run over 1, 2, 3, and so on, usually up to n, which will be the dimension of whatever we're dealing with. Here, 3. Okay, so you have these differential operators, and I need, need a name for them. Now, at the risk of being a, a little bit confusing at the moment, I will, I will call these things uh, del, or nabla, sub a. Okay, so this is, <coughs> this is in, in uh, LaTeX Nabla. Okay, <coughs> now <coughs> I'm cheating a little bit here because Nabla is usually reserved as some other special thing in differential geometry, namely a connection. This is an example of what we're going to, of a connection, but it, at the moment it's just a name for these partial derivatives. And now in terms of these as, as a differential operator. And now in terms of this, let me introduce some uh, familiar differential operator, operators, I, I, I hope, namely grad, curl, and div. Right, so what about grad? So grad takes a function. Now all of my functions in this course are smooth functions. Right, so f is a smooth function. And all it does is it applies this differential operator. And I'm just going to write it like this. Okay, so some people might uh, write it in a more fancy way. I'm just going to think of this in two ways, either as just a list of three partial derivatives, namely the partial derivatives with respect to our chosen coordinate system, or <coughs> I can think of it as a, a vector or a covector, if you like, or whatever. You can think of it in various different ways, but that's my notation for it. Okay, so, um, okay, right, curl, what, what's curl? Curl is something which, uh, if you start with one of these gadgets, and remember that we've agreed to write it just as um, a gadget like this with uh, some index on it, almost everybody uses omega at this stage. <laughs> okay, so, I'm, so I'm trying to sort of follow some sort of standard usage. Right, so you start with this which is a list of things, and you produce from it, <coughs> well, what you do is you, you take all of these derivatives, like, for example, uh, the first two, and you see what are the conditions on these first two derivatives in order that it have a chance of being the derivative of a function. Okay, so here, for example, you might look at the, the first two derivatives, well, let's actually look at the second one. Let's look at 2 and 3. <coughs> and so we know that 2 and 3 is the same as 3 and 2. Okay, uh, 3 and 2. Okay, so that's just the equality of partial derivatives, which I was speaking of before, in this coordinate system. And therefore, <coughs> if you have some gadget like this, if omega has a chance of being the derivative of a function, it had better be that <coughs> the second derivative of the third component minus the third derivative of the second component should be equal to zero. All right, that's certainly a necessary condition to be in the, in the range of this differential operator. So let's assemble all those in a slightly fancy way. So I'm in going to introduce a new gadget here called epsilon. Right, and it's going to be that epsilon, what we're going to do is take epsilon A B, C, many things are being introduced simultaneously here. <coughs> right, I'm going to look at that combination. Now, with no other explanation involved, <coughs> A runs over 1, 2, and 3, and that's just a free index, and it's the same sort of free index as we had to start with. So there's another list of three things. Okay, but here, where you've got a repeated index like B, B, C, and C, what this means is to sum over the repeated index. Okay, so this is a, a standard convention in differential geometry introduced by Einstein. This is called, so I'm, what I'm using here is so-called the Einstein summation convention. 
as I say, a lot of this stuff is, you can write it out in, in, in different notation or whatever, and I'm just getting you used to the notation, or my notation. Right, so I'm using the Einstein summation convention, which in words just says you sum, there's an implicit sum over repeated indices. Okay, so, now I claim that what we're doing is, for example, writing down this, this particular thing. So, epsilon here is supposed to be a gadget which, now for the moment it doesn't really matter whether I write the indices down or up, okay, and it's going to be a totally skew object, so epsilon NPC is totally skew. Right, so it's just a gadget which, if you assign A, B, and C any particular values, 1, 2, and 3, you get a number. If you interchange any of these two indices, you reverse the sign of that number. And <coughs> let's normalize it so that epsilon 1, 2, 3 is, for example, 1. Now, the, these two conditions, in three dimensions, there is only one totally skew object up to scale. That's just usual lin linear algebra fact. And normalizing this way gives you a precise description of what this means. So, for example, this means that uh, uh, epsilon uh, 1, 3, 2 should be minus 1, epsilon 1, 1, 2 should be 0, and so on. Okay, so... <coughs> As you move these things, these indices around by the symmetry group on three letters, they either change sign or they're already zero because they change sign, right? And in particular, you'll notice that <coughs> if I look at this gadget here when A is 1, when A is 1, then B and C are obliged to be either 2 or 3 in order to get something which is non-zero. When you get 2 here, that's picking out 2 there, right? So that and, and, and three there, or the other way around with a sign change. So what I'm doing is magically encoding this thing <coughs> into this expression. Okay? This is called curl. Uh, div is the thing that takes uh, phi with one index on it and takes it to, and again I'm just using the Einstein summation convention, I'm just going to differentiate this And then sum over that. So, you know, explicitly this means that it's just the first derivative of phi 1 plus the second derivative of phi 2 plus the third coordinate derivative of phi 3. Okay, that's, that's divergence. Okay, so these are three differential operators that you, acquire, that you um, come to in applied mathematics almost right away. And this is the beginning of calculus on differential, on, uh, on smooth manifolds. This is the beginning of setting up calculus on smooth manifolds. Um, <coughs> this calculation here, right, that <coughs> if omega happens to be the, the, the gradient of a function and you do this, you get zero, this is encapsulated in these two statements, that you do gradient first to a function and then curl, you get zero. And on the other hand, you can easily check that if you do curl to any vector and compose with divergence, <coughs> you also get zero. Right, so these are the two fundamental facts about this, uh, these differential operators, which <coughs> now we should uh, assemble into a complex. Right? So this course is about complexes of differential operators and the following is a complex. So first of all I'm going to record where these things actually live. Okay so f you're starting with f you're starting with functions. Right and in this course all, all functions are smooth right they have infinitely many derivatives. So all of these functions all of their derivatives exist and uh, to any order, in to, you know, like <coughs> if you differentiate this 5,000 times with respect to the first variable, that exists. So these are smooth functions, okay, but I'm not going to say smooth almost never again for smooth functions. Everything in this course is smooth. 
Okay, <coughs> and then what are these other things? Right, well, traditionally, I'll just use the traditional viewpoint of applied mathematics. This is not the proper viewpoint, but this is the traditional viewpoint. Okay, <coughs> what you usually do is regard this thing as a vector field. Right, this is something with three indices on it, and you're just going to assemble that with, like, you know, <coughs> you're going to look at, uh, you know, this, this is what you would write if you were looking at this as a vector field, d by dx1 plus so on, right? So some sort of vector field where the coefficients are arrived at by differentiating a single function. Right, so here you've got vector fields. Vector fields. Right. And that's div. Oh, sorry, that's grad, sorry. Grad, very good. Okay, the next thing that I've written down here is taking something with one index on it like that, so one, two, three, and you obtain something with three components, one, two, three. All right, so that's another vector field. Traditionally, this is what you do in applied mathematics. And then at the end, <coughs> what you gain by, uh, doing, by taking the divergence of something is another smooth function, so a set of functions. Okay, this is grad, this is curl, this is div. Okay, and then this statement here, that uh, curl composed with grad is zero, and this that divergence composed with curl is zero, is encapsulated into the fact that if you do this, this followed by this, you get zero, and if you do this followed by this, you get zero. That's called a complex. Okay, so this is a complex. Right, so I wrote right on the board what a, what a complex is, but it's just a, a yeah, front seat. Oh, I'm sorry. I think the one, two, and three should be bound here when you define if, 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 ah. on the right when you do an after. Oh. Uh, just after? Just after. So, no, 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 just between. Between. Where one, the one bit doesn't qualify. Ah. So what have I done? <laughs> so, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. This is, this is, yeah, the, the vector field is, uh, uh, okay. Now you, you. No, and then the one in the parentheses. In the, par in the parentheses, you have a one up. One. Oh, well, ah, right, okay. Okay, I, I, have, I have to come clean now. Right, so, <laughs> okay. So when I said, when I said, you know, traditionally, <coughs> People think of these as vector fields, think of these as vector fields, and think as, of these as functions, right? <coughs> they are wrong. I mean, they're simply wrong. I mean, this is, this, is, this is not what you should be doing. It's what you do in applied mathematics all the time, but in the background, in applied mathematics, <coughs> you don't care. <coughs> and here I, here I wasn't caring. Sorry, Francine. <laughs> so I wasn't caring whether to write my indices up or down here, right? So... So you're, you're, you're right that, I mean, I, 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 perhaps I should write this instead. But I'm not going to because, because secretly, <coughs> secretly I'm not really doing, um, I'm not really doing calculus on R3 with these coordinates. I'm doing calculus on Euclidean space. Right, so really secretly this is actually Euclidean space, which means which means that <coughs> I have a, a way of thinking of, of linear functionals on one forms as the same, uh, sorry, linear functionals on vector fields as the same as vector fields. Okay, so this is really Euclidean R3. And so secretly, just jumping ahead a little tiny bit, right, so I, I have in mind the fact that there is actually a metric <coughs> involved in all of this. Right, so <coughs> when I <laughs> okay, so so when I when I um, do differential geometry properly, I should always bear in mind what structure I have around. Okay, and in this particular case, I really have just in order to write these operators in this in this way, I have in mind um, a metric. It's just the usual Euclidean metric, and <coughs> what that means is that uh, you know g one one is one, g two two is one. G33 is 1, 
and all the others are zero, and it's a symmetric, non-degenerate gadget. But it, it's sort of something which you always suppress in applied mathematics completely, right? So <laughs> you, you, you never mention that, and you always think of these things as ending up as vector fields. And this is taking vector fields to vector fields and so on. But you can see there's something funny going on because, of course, as Francine pointed out, <laughs> you get yourself into a little bit of trouble here as to where to put the indices. And also, there's this extra gadget being introduced here. Right? And I've introduced it by means of saying that with all of its indices down, it is totally skew. Okay? But then, you'll notice that when I wrote it over there with all, all of its indices down, here I inadvertently put two of the indices up. Right? This is not allowed in general. It's only allowed if you have a metric. Okay, so <coughs> now, you know, <laughs> this is just something that you, uh, you, you, you have to get used to. Someone has to, has to tell you what structure you're allowed to be using on your manifold. Oh, whoops, I'm giving you the game away now. Manifold. Okay, we'll come to manifold shortly. Um, <laughs> okay, and uh, now, in the, in, the, um, in the Dropbox thing here, there's, there's, uh, there's some notes, but in particular, uh, there's some articles and books which I recommend. So somewhere where all of this is very carefully done is <coughs> a book by um, Roger Penrose and Wolfgang Rindler. Right, it's called Spinners in Space Time. Doesn't sound like a very likely title to be of any use to us at all, but it is. Right, it's Cambridge University Press, 1984. Uh, this is volume one. Right, so <coughs> when, when I start talking about uh, you know, differential geometry, and once we're sort of used to this, I will be using the conventions from this. Okay, this is where I get all my conventions for, like what is, uh, yeah, well, in including, for example, all of this stuff. Right. Okay, so this thing here is the vec this is the vector field I'm talking about. All right, so this is as a vector field. Now, <coughs> as you probably know, it's much better than this. All right, so <coughs> even if you're doing applied mathematics, you would know that this is much better than this. It's not simply that these things compose to zero, but actually to use some sli slightly fancy word, being in the kernel of this operator is precisely the integrability conditions to be in the range of this one. Right, so <coughs> I'll, just, I'll just write some words down and then just say what it means without writing any detail on the board. This thing here is locally exact. Right, the key thing is, uh, the key word here is exact. It means the kernel of the operator that's here, like for example this one, the kernel of this one, is precisely the image of that one. And that means locally means that you start on an open set, you have these differential conditions imposed on, for example, a vector field here. You might have to shrink to go down to a smaller open set to see that it's in the image of that. But actually it's even better than that. It's exact on any... Simply, connect, simply connected, dom oh no. uh, let's say, contractible domain in, let's say, uh, <laughs> let's, let's say on, on, on any, on any uh, contractible domain in R3. Contractable domain in R3. Right, so contractible means uh, it's connected and you can shrink it all down to, 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 to zero. So it's actually exact on, for example, R3 itself. That's perfectly okay. On R3 itself. E.g. So uh, one of the first exercises this, after this afternoon is to, um, is to do a simpler thing on R2. And uh, you, know, you can check by just calculus that this sort of thing is exact on R2. 
Now, this sort of thing means that you're not talking about something like this, 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 and this. There's only three things. There's only two things. Okay. Now, to complete this, to com the complete story is this. Uh, first of all, it's not only not only is it true that if you have something in the kernel of this, it's in the image of that, but actually this one here is surjective. Let me just put a little zero at the end there. Okay. So if you've got something here an arbitrary function satisfying no conditions at all, you can always write it as the divergence of something. Okay, and over here, now here it's slightly different at this end, if you've got a function such that its gradient is equal to zero, that means all of its partial derivatives are equal to zero, and on a connected set that means it's constant. So these are real valued functions, let me just put the real value, the real numbers there and then what you've got is something which is an exact sequence uh, all the way along, starting at zero, ending at zero. Here it just says that if you've got a smooth function whose gradient is zero, it's constant. Uh, that's on all of R3, or <coughs> actually it's, it's actually just locally constant if you're not on all of R3. And here it's exact as said, and then you can pick up anything here as the divergence of something on all of R3. Right, now this is the sort of basis for doing all of this in, um, in a coordinate-free way. Right, so in a coordinate-free way, um, <coughs> so all of this was in, low, in, in, in coordinates on R3. What you do is you try and imagine what would happen if you change coordinates. It's so what does this lead to? So all of this leads to the following. Um, right, so if you think about this carefully, you know, for you know, 20, odd, 20 odd years or something. Actually, it took, took humans quite a long time to realise this. But anyway, <laughs> what, what, they, what they realise is that there is a a coordinate independent way of doing this. Coordinate independent way of saying exactly the same sort of things. Not only that, but previously we were talking about three dimensions. Uh, one thing that happens is you can immediately uh, generalize this to uh, any number of dimensions. And, and then there's some interesting calculations interesting consequences which you can always already see in three dimensions. So a coordinate independent version. So <coughs> instead of having coordinates xa, which just mean coordinates on Rn, these are now viewed as local coordinates. These are local coordinates on Right, just local coordinates. Let's say on, on, a, on a smooth manifold. Right, so, right, so the concept of a smooth manifold just comes up by, um, by trying to make sense of this in a, lo in a local coordinate system and seeing what happens if you change coordinates and then putting it all together so that it happens in a, a, a much more general arena the arena of calculus on a smooth manifold. So what we're doing is calculus on a smooth manifold, on. Okay. And what you do is you write down very sort of similar looking formulae. Okay. First of all, <coughs> you write down what, you, what, you, what used to be the gradient. And you do exactly the same sort of thing. Right. And these formulae are such that in R3, they really are exactly the same formulae. Okay? But because you're doing it in a, in a sort of co coordinate-free way, and I'll explain what that means in just a moment, okay, <coughs> you give this thing a different name. You don't call it the gradient anymore. And in fact, strictly speaking, I suppose the gradient, you'd have to have a metric and raise an index, and then Francine would be very happy. But at the moment, you just take the, the index down like this, and you call this thing the exterior derivative. Uh, 
that's just the name for it. This is the exterior derivative of a function. And then you give new names to these things just to make sure <coughs> that nobody is sort of um, confused with anything on R3 anymore. So this is a function, that's no problem. Right, so a function on a smooth manifold is something which when you write it in local coordinates, it's just a smooth function. This thing, however, you don't think of as a, one, as a vector field anymore. This thing has a new name. It's called a one-form. Right, so this is still a function, but this has a new name. It's called a one-form. Strictly speaking, strictly speaking, when people do this, well, first of all, this exterior derivative have a, has a notation, and people always write it as D. Right, so D is the notation for exterior derivative. It's the exterior derivative of a function. And then, <coughs> second of all, what do they do to make actual really good sense of this? This thing here, what you're really doing is, now I'll write this out explicitly, in local coordinates. This thing here, remember, was our nat notation for just <coughs> coordinate derivative. Now you're taking this thing, and then you... <coughs> you confusingly um, invent these symbols called DXA. Right, and this, this is what happens if you write out D of F in local coordinates where you're being a bit more pedantic. Right? <coughs> and the thing is that <coughs> if you change, diff you change to a different set of local coordinates, I'm not going to do this, but if you change to a different set of local coordinates, then everything is supposed to change in a, in a consistent way. So this is a... <coughs> people normally write the, draw the following pictures. You've got a local court... So you have a manifold. OK, here's a, here's a manifold. Everybody draws a torus for a manifold. Here is a little open set here. It's identified by means of something in... Um, well, uh, at the moment... Well, in Rn. Okay, these are your local coordinates on a manifold. What you do is just think of everything as being functions written out with respect to this coordinate system. But suppose you have a different coordinate system. It means that you have a different patch on your manifold here. Also identified, I'm not going to be very careful here, this is the coordinate system XA, this is the coordinate system XA tilde. And <coughs> um, on the overlap between these two things, on this little region here, <coughs> Right. These are smooth functions of these, and conversely, these are smooth functions of those. Okay. And so in particular, you can write down the partial derivatives with respect to either this system of coordinates or this system of coordinates, but everything is governed by the chain rule. Okay. So, <coughs> for example, if you change to a different set of coordinates here, then <coughs> this thing here, differentiating with respect to this set of coordinates, you would certainly replace that by differ differentiating with respect to the other set of coordinates, like this, we have a, a different index here. And <coughs> what you do is arrange that this gadget transform in exactly the right way that the chain rule um, is taken into account at the as the way that these things are related to those, those things. Okay, so this thing is supposed to be equal to this. Oops. Right. What you're trying to do is arrange that no matter what set of, it, of local coordinates you write down, that this expression is supposed to be equal to that expression. You know how these are related to these, and therefore you decree how these things are related to those things in order for this to work out. Right Now, I'm not going to do this, but this is a sort of decree. Right. It's something that you impose on these gadgets in order that this make perfectly good sense. So what you say is that this is a coordinate-free expression. Coordinate-free. Right. <coughs> I'm a bit pedantic here, though. I put a couple of dots over this O. And that's a pronunci pronunciation thing. This, this, is, this is an English thing where instead of saying coordinates as you would without this, 
strictly speaking, you're supposed to put a couple of dots here to make you pause after the first O, so it's coordinates. Okay, it's not an umlaut. It's a tremor. <laughs> okay, this is a this is an English thing called a tremor. Yeah, and you can achieve it with a hyphen, but, you know, and it used to be that when we all had typewriters and no computers, that's what people would do. <laughs> okay, so they'd write coordinates with a hyphen. But now, now that we have tech and so on, it's good to revert to the sort of good, good old-fashioned way of putting, putting a tremor over the top. Okay, that's what, anyway, that's what I do. So I've, I've, not, I've not gone insane here, I'm just being very old-fashioned. All right. <coughs> Okay, so here, anyway, is a coordinate-free differential operator on any smooth manifold. Now, it's called the exterior derivative. Okay, now, of course, you have to look through, you know, acres of text about how to make all of this precise and how to replace these gadgets here by more appropriate gadgets. But certainly, <laughs> this statement about something being locally exact and starting with the constants... Right, so first of all, there's a name for the smooth functions. Uh, wedge zero. Okay, this is smooth functions. Now, smooth functions on a manifold. And what are these things? These are things, strictly speaking, are one forms. Right, and I'm just going to you know, start doing this as if you know what I'm talking about. But, <coughs> but you should... Uh, look in one of the, the, the many, many books, including this one, or more or less anything to do with uh, calculus on manifolds. So, for example, there's a book by Spivak called Calculus on Ma Manifolds. So they will, they will all set up this sort of thing at great length. I mean, it's very, very painful. You know, to, one, to some extent, you know, writing down mathematics just, just spoils it completely. Right? So this is something which you can sort of pick up and use, <coughs> and eventually you'll get used to it. And then, you know, surprise, surprise, this thing here continues with right, things called two forms. And I'll just write down the local coordinate expression for, <coughs> for the operator which takes a one form to a two form. And it's this. So everybody starts with a one form. Everybody's favorite notation for one form is this. And to take it to its exterior derivative, what you do is differentiate it, of course. All of these things are <coughs> differential operators, and this can be in any local coordinate system. And then what you do, instead of having this awkward gadget called epsilon, you just take the skew part in A and B. Right? So by definition, what you're doing, you're thinking of this thing, for example, as a, as a matrix, or more precisely, a, 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 a form, and you're taking this to something where in indices what you're doing is that. In a local coordinate system, you're just taking this thing and differentiating it and then taking the skew part. And then, <coughs> you know, it's even more obvious that if you start with a function, take its derivative like that and so on, right? It's completely obvious if you do d squared on a function. So, you know, confusingly, all of these operators are called d, even though go they're going from different spaces, right? This is starting with functions. This is starting with one forms. They're all called d. d squared of a function is just you take a derivative of a function like that. That would be derivative. And then you're taking the skew part. And of course, that's zero because this thing's symmetric. Right? Right, so <coughs> it becomes even more obvious that you have exactness at this point. And then, you, of course, you just continue. Right, so, at any stage, what you do is differentiate, and then you take the skew part of the next thing along. So you get a three-form. Right, so I won't even write down what a three-form is. You, you'll be able to invent it for yourselves. Right, and eventually, you end up with um, n-forms. And that's as far as you can go, because on, a, an, on an n-manifold, there are no tensors with n plus 1 indices which are totally skew. This is, this is the end of the road. Right, so this generalizes what this does, this, and this has a name, it's on a manifold, it's called the Durham complex. Durham <coughs> complex. 
Right? And then there are theorems about you know, how, much this, how much this Durham complex resembles what we found in the, in the uh, smooth case. Right? So uh, you take any of these things, like a two-form, and if it's in the kernel of this locally, then it's in the range of that. Right? So this is locally exact. The local exactness is, is a statement of the Poincaré lemma. The Poincaré lemma. It says that it's locally exact. But not globally exact. And on a manifold, it's a very interesting fact that, um, say on a, a compact manifold, the, um, if you look at the, the, uh, the quotient, the um, kernel of this modulo the image of this or whatever, these things are always finite dimensional vector spaces on a compact manifold, and they're related to the shape of the manifold, the topology of the manifold, strictly speaking, the, the singular, singular cohomology of the manifold. And so there's a theorem which goes along, along with this, which is the um, Durham, theorem of Durham cohomology or the theory of Durham cohomology. Right, so Durham cohomology is the, is the extent to which, discusses the extent to which this fails to be a complex <coughs> when you think of things globally rather than locally. Okay, and again, there's some, some uh, simple example of that uh, this afternoon in the uh, exercises. All right, so, <coughs> so more or less for the rest of the, the, co the course, I'll, I'll take this, this, this sort of construction of calculus on a manifold and the Durham complex and so on as, as, as read. Right? So, <coughs> and many of the things in this course will be variations on this, variations on the Durham complex. One of the uh, articles in the Dropbox here is... <coughs> an article called Variations on the Durham Complex. Okay, variations on, on the Durham Complex. It, it's uh, by me. It's from some years ago, 1999, I think. But it's in, it's in the Dropbox anyway. And it goes over this. It's written for the uh, notices of the American Mathematical Society. It's supposed to be an elementary exposition. And it starts with the Durham complex and it does things to it. One of the things it does not discuss is actually my favourite example. So I'm now going to present my favourite example of <coughs> a variation on the, on the Durham complex. And that will be a starting point for many other things. Okay, so we're going back to R3. <coughs> this is definitely something which is, which is certainly not available on a smooth manifold in general. There is definitely some extra structure lying around. So we'll start with R3 again. Okay, and this is a complex which was uh, found by saint -Venon. Uh, <coughs> a long time ago. Uh, when was it? 1864. Okay, so I'm going to write down three differential operators which look a little bit like grad, curl, and div. And they will have very, very similar properties. But they're not called grad, curl, and div anymore. The first one is called killing. Uh, and I, I thought for many years that the killing operator and so on and the killing equation were having to do with things being annihilated or killed. But, but it's not. It's named, after a <laughs> it's, it's named after a German mathematician called killing. Okay, so there's no, no, uh <coughs> nothing untoward in this. Right? So what does the killing operator do? It takes a vector field. And uh, so, as, as, as you. So, so it's all, all, all just sort of emphasized that I'm thinking of it as a vector field. I'll call it X. Everybody writes X for vector field. 
this is a vector field on R3. It's a list of three things. Right. <coughs> Similar to what we had in the uh, uh, grad curl div complex. And it takes it to this. It takes it to, you differentiate it like that. Again, this is all with respect to local coordinates. And then, <coughs> instead of taking the skew part, as you would do for the, for the uh, for curl, you take the symmetric part instead. Okay, so that means one half of <coughs> this plus the other way around. Okay. <coughs> So there's, there's some notation being snuck in the back door here. <coughs> when I write skew part like that, this is what I mean. When I write symmetric part, I have round brackets instead of square brackets around the indices. And this is following this notation, following this is my example. Okay. <coughs> anyway, that's the first operator. Uh, the second operator is called, in applied mathematics, it's called curl curl. And I'll tell you a little bit about where this comes from in applied mathematics shortly. But that takes something here, which is a symmetric form. Let's write H for our symmetric form. Okay, so this thing here is symmetric. Right, what, I'm, what I'm looking for is integrability conditions, really. I'm looking for conditions on this thing which guarantee that it's in the range of this operator. And... It's a little bit different from what we had before in that you have uh, two indices. Oh, first of all, it's a second-order operator. That's the main difference. It's a second-order operator. So you have two epsilons, which is why applied mathematicians call it curl-curl rather than just one curl, which has basically constructed from this. And you do this. So let's do C and D here, B, E, and F. Right, applied to, and then you take two derivatives. Right, so say C and ah, uh, uh, sorry, wait a minute. sorry, sorry. Let me ah, no, okay. Let, let's. Re this is not what I've got in the. I've just got my indices have different names in the notes. That's all right. Okay, so here, what I'm doing is taking this this arrangement. Okay, D and E are symmetric. Uh, D and F, it's symmetric in D and F. Unfortunately, D and F here are on different epsilons. Otherwise, you'd be trying to contract something which was skew with something which was symmetric, and you'd get zero. And similarly, C and E, remember in flat space, whatever it is, it's symmetric in the C, E indices. So I put the C and E on different epsilons here, and then there's A and B, like that. Okay, and this thing here, if you interchange D and F, you know you get zero here, but if you interchange D and F, you can just relabel what all of these things are called, and you find that this thing is symmetric. So it's taking a symmetric tensor to another symmetric. Okay, you're starting with a symmetric tensor, ending up with a symmetric tensor. And then the last thing is just another, another divergence, but slightly different. You're just going to take one divergence on one index. So you have something here which is uh, symmetric, and <coughs> for mysterious reasons, I will call this thing R. Capital R. It's mysterious for the moment. This is a symmetric tensor. And you take that to just while well, taking one, di one, one divergence like that on just one index. Okay, and I claim that this thing here has many of the fine properties that the Dram complex has, and it's locally exact and so on. So let me just... Uh, <coughs> let me just write down the spaces where you're going between, or whatever. You're starting with uh, vector fields. Right, and then there's this operator which I call killing. I won't, won't write it again there. We're ending up with symmetric tensors. Right, this is the first, year, first time I've used the word 
uh, tensor. But a tensor in general in, in, is just a, a gadget with a bunch of indices on it, okay, naively, so that if you write it out in local coordinates, ex exactly an array like this. This would be a symmetric matrix if you did that. Uh, going to symmetric tensors. <coughs> and then going back to vector fields. Okay, and right, at the beginning of next lecture, I'll work out what to put here. It's not clear what to put here. I've got a big question mark at the moment. But apart from figuring out what to go, what goes there, this is a locally exact complex. Uh, I've got the words written here exactly the same. So this all these things that were, were, were true of the Durham complex apply to this complex as well. Okay, and you might wonder why it is that someone in, uh, in um, 1864 would think of such a thing. Right, and the answer is that these things here are, again, things that you find in applied mathematics. Right? <coughs> this vector field here, what you're doing is you're thinking of how various forces act on a little piece of material. And this thing here is if you're, if you're moving the material just a little bit. Uh, this is called um, a displacement. Displacement. So I'll just give you the names that people use in applied mathematics. This is displacement. And then the rest of it, I, what I'm talking about is um, an extract from continuum mechanics. This is called the uh, strain. These are just names, but <coughs> applied mathematicians call these things by the following names. This is called the load. And this is something from the theory of lin linear elasticity. Okay, this is from linear elasticity. Right. <coughs> there is a nonlinear theory lying around as well. That's called continuum mechanics. Okay, so continuum mechanics. It's something which uh, applied mathematicians speak of and continuum mechanics is something which, from a pure mathematical point of view, there's a completely different interpretation of it. And for example, that's why I called this thing R. It's the Ricci tensor, right? But, okay, now never mind about that for the moment. These are just... Just things that you can write down on open sets in R3. Now, of course, the question is, you know, why? You know, why is this thing locally exact? Right? Especially, especially as it's got this uh, second-order operator here. Right? This is totally weird. If you've not seen this before, these are second-order conditions on something being in the range of a first-order mapping. Right. Now... Okay, that, that's, that's it for today, except I'll just say that many of the things that you encounter in mathematics can be expressed in terms of complexes of differential operators. And in particular, many of the things that you encounter in pure mathematics, including in several complex variables, I'll say how this arises next time, can be expressed in things having to do with either the Durham complex or variations on the Durham complex. Okay, so we'll get to that next time. But at the moment, that's just mostly just notation, apart from this really very exotic uh, complex that we've just we've just found, or that I've repeated from a finding from 1864. Okay, all will, all will will be revealed shortly. Okay, thank you. <coughs>